Where do you go if there isn't enough land for you? Where do you go if the small parcels of land still available are beset by droughts, often for many years at a time? Well, the answer was the same for many cultures throughout the world. You went to America, the land of opportunity. Yet while opportunities in America were many, they were also high risk with low pay. And this was certainly true for the Cape Verde Islanders who took to the sea and became some of the most famous of the whalers and sailors of the great oceans. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, National Park Service Ranger here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And today we're gonna to explore the wonderfully alive community of the Cape Verdeans here in the Blackstone Valley. The tale of men leaving for the sea and leaving behind their homeland, their families and their loved ones created a culture of strong women and a rich musical tradition that many of us from other cultures can appreciate and identify with. So join me as we explore the Cape Verdeans and hear with their own voices about their traditions, their music, and the contributions they made to the Blackstone Valley. the Cape Verdean experience and the transitions uh, within the Cape Verdean world and the meeting of the old country and the new. Music was a part of a lot of things that happen in life. When we had the religious festivals, music was a part of it. When you had something sad happen, there's a way that Cape Verdeans mourn at a funeral that is kind of a chant. And sometimes the old folks used to do it. I don't think they do it so much anymore. They would talk about the person's past. Oh, how I miss you. Oh. Ainya John, Jabubai, John Tiskisebu, Nkata Tiskisebu, Nunka. You know, and they were saying, oh, you have gone and I've missed you so much, I'll never forget you. And this things people would do at a wake. And we call it Choragiza, okay? When um, Cape Verdeans first came here and tried to establish, as any immigrant group would, tried to establish their, their communities here, what they found is that they had difficulty with some of their very basic needs. So for example, when they wanted a, a place to, to worship, there would be problems. Cape Verde has been a Catholic country since the mid-15th um, century. And when they came to the United States, they found that most of the, Cape Verde, most of the Catholic churches were not churches that necessarily would accept people of color and they went first to Portuguese churches and, and, and a lot of people have told me that they felt that they were not welcomed by the Portuguese churches because they were people of color. When they, on the other hand, went to African American churches, number one, most of those were Protestant and there was reluctance to go outside of the Catholic religion. And on the second part, a number of the African American church members did not welcome them because they were looked on as foreigners, people who spoke another language. So you will find if you look at the early um, Cape Verdean religious groups, they had to really start their own churches. A lot of times I hear Americans saying that, um, oh, they're always speaking their language, they don't really want to learn English. That's not true. I don't know anyone who comes to this country that doesn't want to learn English. Sometimes the opportunity isn't always there because people have to work. I have a cousin, uh, my cousin's husband lives in Pawtucket, and he said, I put one foot in this country, I put the next foot into the mill, into the factory. And he's been working in the factory ever since. And sometimes the economics of living in this country do not always give people the opportunities to learn English and to, do, to, to better themselves. So like a lot of other immigrant groups, Cape Verdeans put a lot of um, stock 
in their children and getting their kids educated and making a better life for their kids. I think that happens in most cultures. Cape Verdean voices, they speak to us of their history and their traditions and their struggle to find their place here in America. And we're standing at India Point Park in Providence, Rhode Island. And you can tell from the rotted shipping piers behind me that in fact this was a major hub for shipping in New England. And the Cape Verdeans played a very important role in the history of shipping here in Providence. There were many influences that shaped the Cape Verdean culture. Portuguese rule, the cloak's proximity to major shipping lanes, and their very strong African influences all helped create their traditions, their language, and their music. But to learn more about these influences, join me as we hook up with Marlene Lopes, the Special Collections Librarian at Rhode Island College. So that I think the culture is made much richer by having the intermingling of the African and the Portuguese. But also, it, while these two were the, probably the strongest influences in making up the Cape Verdean, there were influences from other countries also. So, and, I, and I think it's, uh, it's good to, to recognize those two, because you would see, for example, with the Italian influence, mm -hmm. with certain names and music, all along we have music um, a, as part of the contributions of the various people. Um, we have the, the Jews that came to Cape Verde as part of a result of the activity of the Inquisition. You have sailors and men of the sea from many different countries who came to the Cape Verde Islands, who stopped in the Cape Verde Islands, and as a result, they're intermingled with, with the people who are the Cape Verdeans today. So the strength is in the fact the, the culture is made richer by having elements of so many other cultures. Cape Verde was a multicultural society, but it was very natural to look around at your own family and see people of different, col different colors. And I think there, was all, there is also something to be said about being the majority in a country and then moving to a country where you were in the min minority. In coming to the United States, the Cape Verdean faced for the first time having this, this distinction of having to fit into one or the other of two racial categories. So no longer could the Cape Verdean maintain a Cape Verdean existence and be counted for anything. So in order to be a part of the mainstream United States, it meant that you had to suddenly make your racial identity the most important part of your, of your entire self. And I don't think that most people thought that way. I think the r racial part of your identity was just, it was something that you saw, something that you could acknowledge and recognize, but that it did not make you of a certain a status or, or of a certain, entitled to certain rights or privileges. And I think that that was very difficult. The Cape Verdeans also had had contacts with Americans probably for many, many years before they had started coming to this country in any great numbers. Cape Verdean uh, men had been participating in the American whaling industry, which meant that the whale, whaling uh, vessels would leave the United States and would pick up workers in the Cape Verde as they did in the Azores. And these men would then come to the United States and frequently would go back home after they'd made some money. But what that meant is that they probably had an idea of the racism in the United States and had an idea of the status of people of color in the United States. So there were a number of factors, I think, that would make a group coming to the United States looking for that dream to, to realize that for some reason they were not going to have full access to the dream and that the thing that was going to stop them was an aspect about themselves that didn't seem to have ever have had that much of an influence. I think it needs to be understood in the context of the time. So we're talking 
oh, maybe 1905, 1910, up around the time where in this country there were very strong feelings about immigrant groups coming into the country, particularly immigrant groups who had a darker skin color. And we're, included, we're including here Southern Europeans. So this is when Italians and Portuguese and others were coming in who had not come in in big numbers prior to this time. And I think there was, if you read what was happening in a, a, in a lot of these circumstances, there was a lot of prejudice against these people. And I think that the people coming in, in turn, in their need to be able to, to get ahead themselves and to do what they had come here to do, needed, felt that they had to look around and see ways that they could make themselves above other groups. Did the role of music help develop a sense of community among the Cape Verdeans? I believe that music is a very import, important um, unification point with Cape Verdeans. Cape Verdeans coming here would have brought their music. And again, the music was the music of the violins of Portugal and the rhythms of Africa and mazurkas from Europe and valses from Europe and all kinds of, of music that was brought at that time and deliberately preserved and kept by the people who came here. So music was one of the, the cultural markers, we'll say, that Cape Verdeans made an effort to keep, to, to keep the same so that this is something that was Cape Verdean. If you knew this music, then that, sh that was a way of showing that you were a Cape Verdean. Marlene, can you tell me how the Cape Verdean community managed to maintain and nurture its culture in the face of so many distractions and outside influences? Well, this question of how to maintain your identity is actually something that was taken up by a, a group of Cape Verdean intellectuals. This was a group of doctors and, and lawyers and, and ordinary people who in the 1930s looked around and realized that a decision had to be made. And that decision would be whether the way to succeed would be to try to blend into American culture as quickly as possible recognizing that that would mean blending into the African-American community and perhaps not retaining all of the Cape Verdean parts that they might want to. Or they could choose to deliberately preserve as much as possible of the Cape Verdean and to teach people so that they would not forget. And this group of, of men who met in Boston decided that they would they would teach people about their own culture. They would have lessons where people would learn the dances, and they would have programs where there would be music, and there would be poetry, and they would invite people to come from the islands to perform, as well as having Cape Verdean Americans do the dancing and the singing and the reading. And that they would collect books and other materials so that there would be a library so that they would have history they would have the Cape Verdean history with them. Wherever there are Cape Verdeans, the Cape Verdeans will have massive clippings files or they have photographs or save program books. And it has been a deliberate attempt to say, we are Cape Verdean. We are Cape Verdean because we know our music, we know our language, we know our food, we have our history, we really were there. And that's important in a society that often doesn't see you or that would like to see you but only through its own glasses. This way you can let history speak for, us, for itself. So for a little country, it's had quite an influence over a long period of time, but it is a tiny place with not that many people so that, again, we come back to the idea of what it meant for this small group of people, this minority within a minority, to have an identity in the United States, to be recognized as themselves when very few people could see them at all. Joseph Conrad.
Conrad, a great writer and a pretty fair sailor too, once wrote, there's nothing so enticing, disenchanting, and enslaving as life at sea. And he knew of what he spoke, having sailed the oceans of the world as a young man. A sailor's life is hard. The sea is a tough master. And yet, the Cape Verdeans were legendary sailors. To learn a little bit more about these hardworking sailors and their influence here in Providence, let's catch up with National Park Service Ranger Kevin Kleiberg and learn about the Cape Verdean packet trade. One of the few opportunities available to the men of the drought-stricken Cape Verde Islands was to sign on as crew aboard a whaling vessel. Wages were poor compared to other occupations at the time, but with the limited opportunities available in the islands, most men viewed whaling as a great chance to get ahead. Hi, I'm National Park Service Ranger Kevin Kleiberg, and this is a Blackstone moment. It was through whaling that the Cape Verdeans gained respect and a great reputation as some of the finest seafarers in the world. They cut their teeth in sailing in the whaling industry, the most dangerous occupation in the 1700s and early 1800s. It was these dangerous conditions that made whaling a truly integrated trade, for it was common to see a Cape Verdean, African, or West Indian as the harpoonist, first mate, or captain. Those positions of respect and skill were earned by the Cape Verdean sailors. As demand for whale oil and other whaling products declined, new opportunities were sought to keep the Cape Verdean seamen gainfully employed. Antonio Colo, a former whaler, purchased the Nellie May, a 64-ton fishing schooner, and hired an old Cape Verdean whaler as its captain. His vision was to set up a trade route between the Cape Verde Islands and the growing Cape Verdean community in Providence, Rhode Island, and New Bedford, Massachusetts. With 50 passengers paying $15 each and a cargo of goods bound for the friends and families of Cape Verdeans living in New England, the Nellie May set sail in 1892 from the island of Robert of Providence. The voyage took 45 days due to some bad luck. The captain had a heart attack and the first mate got lost. The return trip, however, only took 28 days with 117 paying passengers and a cargo of goods. And thus, the packet trade between New England and the Cape Verdean Islands was born. Providence became the home port for these packet traders, and this new commercial enterprise tested the seafaring skills of the Cape Verdeans. The packet trade vessels were often converted whalers, old refitted schooners, and in some cases, salvaged vessels. They were a patchwork fleet that required outstanding sailors and captains to navigate the dangers of the Atlantic Ocean. The seasonal arrival of the packet traders would coincide with the upcoming cranberry harvest and was a major event in the Cape Verdean community. Large crowds would welcome the ships, greeting old friends and family, sharing cups of sugarcane grog, and dancing to the mornas. In the fall, after the cranberry harvest, the packet ships would head back across the Atlantic to the Cape Verde Islands, providing an important link to the homeland. All summer long, goods were collected to be shipped back to families in the islands. As with any immigrant group coming to America, the gut-wrenching dilemma of how to make a new life here without abandoning the old culture and those left behind was always on the minds of the Cape Verdeans. Fortunately, these tough little packet ships lessened the severity of that dilemma by keeping the tie between the homeland and New England a strong one. And the sailors aboard these packet ships were the equal of their whaling ancestors. Well, this has been National Park Service Ranger Kevin Kleiberg with a little piece of Blackstone Valley history. The location of the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, just off the West African coast, near the countries of Mauritania and Senegal, south of Portugal and the Azores, and east of Brazil, made them an ideal place for sailors to pick up fresh water and cruise for the sailing adventures. Looking at a map, it's easy to visualize the African and Portuguese influences on this island chain. While all cultures claim that music plays an integral part of their lives, few live it like the Cape Verdeans do. To truly understand the role that music and family plays with the traditions of the Cape Verdeans, Let's catch up with Yvonne Smart, branch librarian at the Fox Point Library, Providence Public Library System. In Cape Verdean music, we have um, something that is called Sodad, and that is, it's a longing, it's a, a wanting to be back, it's a, it's a feeling that you have, that you want to be back. If you're in America, you want to be in Cape Verde. If you're in Cape Verde, you want to be in America. It's a feeling of longing, and a lot of our music has, has this feeling of, of longing and uh, mournfulness, which is 
um, usually invoked through the musical um, stringed instruments or through the voice. For Kay Verdon's music was a very important part of our life. We loved to dance and um, young people today say there's not, no such thing as a Kay Verdon concert because nobody can sit still. <laughs> so whenever there's music, you have to be moving around and dancing. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the, the kitchen dance and how that's kind of reflective of maybe the current communities? Well, the kitchen dances, um, let's talk about Fox Point, because okay. I grew up here in Fox Point. Um, I guess when the Cape Verdeans first started coming in, and up until the 40s and maybe early 50s, we had something we call the kitchen dance. And that was a dance that you held right in your own home. Usually they would take all the furniture and put it aside. If you had a rug, you'd roll it up. And the women would come and cook and bring food. And there would be uh, men would come with violins and and uh, whatever instruments they had. And if you didn't have an instrument, you could always hit the beat, you know, on on your body or on on a board or something. And um, people would just make just sing. Different people would take turns coming up and singing, and and you just have a good time. And it was a situation where you didn't have older people in, in one place and younger people. Everybody was together, older, younger people, uh, grandparents, little kids. And it was a great opportunity from what I've, I've learned from some of the people who come from musical families for one generation to pass down their music and their techniques to the next so that you may have a young kid sitting next to a master violinist and he might be just watching him now but maybe in a couple of weeks then he'll pick up the violin and he'll start playing and this is a way that our music was passed down um, within families and outside of families um, from one generation to another. A lot of times they were for a christening, um, a wedding, a birthday, just because somebody, you talked about Caveridians being seamen, because somebody was here from the sea. Like whenever one of the Caveridian packets came in, like the Madeline or the Ernestina or some of the older packets would come in, hey, that was an occasion to have a kitchen dance. It was an occasion to have a dance. So sometimes there was a reason for it. Sometimes it was just because people felt like having a good time. Caveridian music is, is different to each person who listens to it. And I think that for a person who is Cape Verdean, when you hear that Cape Verdean music, it's, it's just like a Frenchman listening to a French song. It, it evokes all kinds of feelings of, of home. And, and when you hear that music, somehow it makes you feel, aha, that's a part of me. That's something that belongs to me. Now, maybe you can listen to it and you can appreciate it, but you won't understand it like I do. You won't feel it like I do. How is there a mix between the African instruments and European instruments? Well, it's interesting that um, for many years, we uh, American Cape Verdeans didn't know too much about the African history um, of our islands. And um, the Portuguese had suppressed a lot of that, so that there, there weren't a lot of uh, drums available in Cape Verde. But the people found a way to get around that. And one reason, one way they did that was, um, for example, on the island of Santiago, um, where they had celebrations, special celebrations. And we have something we call a pilon, which is a, a mortar and pestle. It could be made out of uh, wood. It could be made out of um, stone. And people would beat the mortar and pestle in rhythm. And so that the Portuguese didn't catch on, I guess, that they weren't just grinding corn, that they were actually making songs and and doing this in rhythm. So those things that were suppressed before independence, after independence, which was in 1975 in Cape Verde, have had a resurgence. And so we're hearing about all kinds of Cape Verdean music now. We're dancing. We've brought back a lot of the older forms of music. And there's a new appreciation for it. The Fox Point community. Mm -hmm. um, how important was that to uh, uh, the Cape Verdeans, both here and in, in, in the islands? You know, it was interesting that, that um, Cape Verdeans and Cape Verde all knew about Fox Point, you know? And we, they had a, um, people had a unique way of saying things like, you know, Brook Street, Wicked and Street, you know, we could say it with an accent, but if you went, people from Cape Verde would know about New Bedford, about, about um, Wareham, about all these towns, Fairhaven, um, Blackstone, a lot of people went into the Blackstone area, Cape Verdeans, to work in the mills, uh, Woonsocket, and 
Cape Verdeans used to say, Pataket, Wonsaket, Providencia, you know. And these were towns that people knew about in Cape Verde because these were towns that their relatives lived in and maybe sent letters back and maybe, you know, sent money back in those letters when they sent letters back to Cape Verde. Growing up, we all were aware of which island our parents and grandparents came from. Um, lineage and family ties are very important. Maybe because when Cape Verdeans came to this country, they met with prejudice. There was uh, a lot of problems because of color. Um, and that tends to make people bind together more. But Cape Verdeans always had this feeling of wh where, which island are you from? It's kind of like a game. We like, to, we like to find how we're related to one another. It's almost like a game. So one of the first things when you meet a Cape Verdean, whether in America or in Kavit, they ask you, who is your family? And I remember one of the first things I learned as a little girl, it's almost like a little thing. I had, I learned how to say, you know me Yvonne, Yvonne de Maria, Maria de Gimar, Gimar de Franca Italiano de Furna na Brava. Now what that means is, my name is Yvonne, the daughter of Mary, the daughter of Gimar, the daughter of Frank the Italian from the, from the city of Furna in the island of Brava in Cape Verde. See, now if anybody, if they're not related to you that way, then you go another way. Then you say, Maria Dinho José de Brás, okay? And that would be, my mother's name is Mary of Jo de Brás, okay? That would be her father. Then you find out if you're related that way. Usually, somebody finds some kind of a connection. Then you say, oh, no, se primo, oh, we're cousins. And then you have to trace the genealogy. And it's, it's whether it's in America or Cape Verde, wherever you go, Cape Verde will ask you, who's your family? Cape Verde women had to be very strong women. I mean, my grandmother tells the story that my grandfather left on those whaling ships. He left for it sometimes years at a time. And he came back. He didn't have too much money. And my grandmother had to be pretty resourceful to, to take care of the family and to, and to keep things going, especially when they really didn't, you know, know when the men were coming back, if they were coming back. You know, um, ladies had to be pretty strong, not only on this side of the, 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 of the ocean, but also the women that were left in Cape Verde. I mean, women were left for years at a time. Islands were so poor, things were so poor, just like in some of the other country, countries you mentioned, people had to leave. It wasn't a, it wasn't a choice, really. It was a, it was a case of necessity. Grandmother was very poor. She gave me two things. I always say she gave me two things. She gave me a language other than English, because she, she taught me how to speak Creole, and she taught me how to do embroidery, which I still do. Right? So those are the two gifts she gave me. She, she danced. My grandmother danced. She taught me how to dance, too. And um, those were gifts that you can't replace with money and that you can't buy with money, so I, I think she, she did pretty well. As I talked and listened with the various members of the Cape Verdean community, I was struck by how similar their story of immigration to America was to the other major immigrant groups who also came to the Blackstone Valley. The richness of America is seen in the richness of the music of the various immigrant groups who brought their music with them as they came to America to seek a better way of life. And it's a story that we all share, regardless of our skin color, regardless of our religious beliefs, and regardless of our place and origin. We focus on what we have in common, which is a great deal. Rather than our differences, you'd be surprised what we can accomplish. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And if you haven't discovered Cape Verdean music, what are you waiting for? We'll see you in the valley.